Hi, I'm Darren Miles with Darren Miles Photography based here in beautiful, sunny Naples, Florida. Canon has introduced yet another wide-angle lens. This one of the L variety with the new 16-35 f4 ISL lens that relatively speaking is a good value when compared to similar first-party options from the likes of both Canon and Nikon. With its slightly narrower f4 aperture, but with the addition of image stabilization and some groundbreaking aspects to the image quality, is the new 16-35 f4 worth its $1,199 price tag? Well, we're going to spend the next 10 to 12 minutes to find out. Okay, so first up is the build quality. Now, there's little doubt right out of the gate that this is an L lens, as it's constructed very similarly to the newer L lenses that Canon has put out. That is to say, it's a combination of tightly assembled and high quality plastics, which make up the bulk of the exterior housing. And there is some metal, for example, the lens mount is made out of metal. But the filter threads, on the other hand, are made out of plastic, and the, di the diameter of that front element is 77 millimeters. Now coming in at one pound four ounces, the 16 to 35 is on the lighter side for a wide angle lens. To be clear, it's not light, it's just lighter than the f2.8 offerings that dominate the marketplace. The f4 aperture means that there's gonna be less glass on the inside, making for a lighter weight lens, which is nice if you're gonna be out shooting all day long. On the inside, there are 16 elements arranged in 12 groups, and there are nine rounded aperture blades for pleasing out of, out of focus rendering which, for the record on a wide-angle lens, isn't necessarily a top priority as you're, usually, as you're usually trying to get everything in sharp focus, even at its widest f4 aperture. So bokeh quality is nice to have, but it's not gonna be a deal breaker. Now, out of the box, the lens isn't weather sealed, but interestingly, Canon says that when an optional 77 millimeter protect filter is used, the lens realizes dust and water resistance for use in trying environmental conditions. So that's sort of a mixed bag, as it's only partially reassuring. On the last note, unlike many of the other ultrawides in the marketplace, specifically from Nikon and Tokina, the 16-35 doesn't have a bulbous front element, meaning that you can use traditional screw-on filters, which has the potential to save a lot of money, even if you're required to get one to realize weather sealing. Now, the focus ring, to my hand, is pretty well dampened with just a little bit of friction. The focus ring is really smooth, well dampened, and to me offers just the right amount of resistance. It has a nice quality feel. Finally, the aperture ranges from a constant f4 throughout the zoom range all the way to f22 also throughout the zoom range. I wish the materials it was, ma it was made out of were stronger than plastic, and I also wish it was weather sealed out of the box. On the upside, at least you can remedy one of those two things, but in the end for build, the 16-35 f4 gets a very solid 9 out of 10. So up next is autofocus speed and accuracy. If you watch my other reviews, you'll probably notice that when it comes to wide-angle photography and wide-angle lenses, for me anyway, I find that AF speed, I find it's kind of like bokeh rendering. That is, it usually isn't usually a top priority because when you're shooting at f8 or f9 or f10, the goal is a wide depth of field. So focus speed isn't going to be a huge consideration because generally you're shooting still subjects and trying to get all of it in focus. Now that said, the 16-35 is outfitted with a ring type ultrasonic motor for brisk and completely silent focus. And let me tell you, it is fast. But if I'm shooting still subjects, is there any real benefit to being able to focus in under a split second? Well, not really. However, I'm sure there are instances out there when fast focus and wide angle lenses are nice, but even with a slower focus motor like saying the Tokina, the elements on the inside don't need to move all that much and focus is going to be captured pretty quickly. Now speaking for myself, I'm usually shooting interiors, so I haven't had the opportunity to take advantage of fast moving subjects with this lens, but my experience with the focus of the 16 or 35 has been nearly perfect, and again, it's really quick if you need it for say the occasional action shot. The 16 to 35 captures and locks focus with absolute certainty. So really, there's nothing to fault here. So for AF speed and accuracy, the 16 to 35 gets a perfect 10 out of 10. So up next is optical quality and the quality of the results. Now I shoot between 15 and 40 homes per week, and I pay a lot of attention to certain details when I'm shooting in wide angle. Like, how's the edge performance? How does the lens handle flare? 
And are the chromatic aberrations under control in high contrast areas like around the edges of window frames? Well, I'm happy to report that in all three of those areas, the 16 to 35 handles them all with aplomb. In fact, what's arguably most impressive about the 16 to 35 F4 is in fact its performance into bright light. I'd go as far as to say that the optical performance is groundbreaking, specifically for a wide angle lens. For example, the chromatic aberration performance is particularly impressive, as in my experience thus far, it's basically irrelevant. You also don't get that haze in the transition areas around windows, specifically in dark rooms that require a long shutter speed to get them exposed correctly. In those situations, you're usually blowing out the windows, and it often causes a hazy, chromatic aberration filled mess of a transition from the bright to the dark area. For example, as much as I love the Tokina 16 to 28 f2.8, and I do, it struggles like most wide angle lenses in the high contrast transition areas. Conversely, the 16 to 35 handles the transitions amazingly well. Moreover, the addition of image stabilization has some added value if, say, you don't shoot with a handheld remote, as the IS will offset any camera shake when you press the shutter, which matters in low light situations that require a long shutter speed. But overall, I'm extremely pleased with the results of the 16 to 35. However, as with all of my reviews, it's one thing to tell you about the optical quality, it's another thing to demonstrate the optical quality. The next minute or two will be a series of stills and video clips showcasing the optical goodness of the Canon EF 16-35 F4 ISL, and they are certainly worthy of Canon's L designation, as this lens is optically impressive. So last up is about the only sticking point with the 16 to 35, and that's value. Because at $1,199, this lens is by no means inexpensive, but it is relatively inexpensive when compared to first party options from both Canon and Nikon. You give up the f2.8 aperture compared to those lens, lenses, but you gain IS, and the focus motor is much faster than third party options like, say, from Tokina. When compared to Canon's 16 to 35 L f2.8, there's a $500 price difference in favor of the f4. So basically, you're paying a premium for a similar lens with better low light performance. Now, when compared to third party options like the 16 to 28 f2.8 from Tokina, you gain image stabilization and much better chromatic aberration and flare performance. But again, you lose that f2.8 aperture and the Tokina is $560 less than this. Their optical performance is similar, again, except for the aforementioned chromatic aberration performance. And truthfully, the Tokina does generate a bit more haze in high contrast situations or in situations when you're shooting into direct sunlight, which frankly can be very difficult to manage in post-processing. So in my mind, I think the 16 to 35 is worth more than the Tokina, assuming that like most architectural and landscape photographers, you're shooting at f8 and you don't usually need the additional stop of light in your photography. However, if you're a wedding photographer who uses wide angle lenses, then the f2.8 aperture may come in handy in a church or in some other venue. The other option is Canon's own 17 to 40 f4. Now, I haven't used that lens, but the feedback is it's optically very good and a great value. 
but you lose one millimeter on the wide end, which doesn't sound like much, one millimeter. But one millimeter on the wide end is more significant percentage-wise than only one millimeter would indicate. You also lose image stabilization, but keep in mind the 17 to 40 is only $839 or $360 less than this. So it really comes down to what you're going to use it for. In my line of work in real estate photography, there's a lot of value in the 16 to 35 f4. Now I just wish it was only marginally more expensive than the competent third-party options like the 16 to 28 from Tokina. And given the price difference between this and the 17 to 40 f4, well, $1,199 is looking like a healthy premium. For a lens, it's definitely better in some critical optical areas for wide-angle photography, but I just don't think they're twice as good. But that said, if you do need the very best in image quality, then it's up to you if the 16 to 35 is worth the premium. For me, in my line of work, it is. So for value, the 16 to 35 gets a very solid 8.5 out of 10. <laughs>and they live up to the L quality expectations. Now the lens is not weather sealed out of the box, but a simple UV filter does in fact make the lens weather and dust resistant. It's pretty weighty, comes in at one pound four ounces, but it's much lighter than the F2.8 offerings in the marketplace. So overall for build, it's pretty solid and we gave it a nine out of 10. Autofocus speed and accuracy. Now, in my opinion, there aren't too many situations that require ultra fast focus when you're shooting with an ultra wide angle lens but the USM motor that's included with the 16 to 35 is very brisk and perfectly accurate when and if you need it for that occasional action shot. Now, I really don't for the majority of what I do, but just the same, there's nothing to fault here. So for AF speed and accuracy, the 16 to 35 gets a perfect 10 out of 10. Optical quality and the quality of the results. Again, in my line of work with ultra wide angle lenses in real estate photography specifically, the 16 to 35 shines as it delivers excellent edge to edge sharpness and does a really excellent job of managing many of the pitfalls that usually accompany a wide angle lens. Specifically, chromatic aberrations are almost non-existent, which to me is really impressive. There's also not a ton of haze in those same transition areas, like around windows for interior shots. And flare, when you're shooting into the sun, for example, in my experience, is extremely well controlled. Now, just for the record, I read one review, I believe it was from lenstip.com, who claimed that the lens's performance against bright light was poor. Now, I'm not experiencing the kind of flare patterns that they have displayed in their website with this lens at all, which may indicate some production variance with this lens, but I'm basing my rating on the lens that I have. So for optical quality and the quality of the results, we gave the 16 to 35 f4 a 10 out of 10 for both. Value. To me, it's about the only sticking point with the 16 to 35 f4. Don't get me wrong, this is a great lens. Really, it's a great lens with some groundbreaking improvements in some very critical areas in optical quality, specifically, again, for wide-angle lenses. It's just that there's so much competent competition out there for considerably less money that, frankly, you just have to look at and consider the, the alternatives in the marketplace. Now, that said, if you're like me and you shoot a lot of real estate, then things like flare and chromatic aberration matter, and the Canon is definitely better than the lower value-priced and excellent Tokina 16-28 f2.8. Chromatic aberrations can ruin a shot, even when they're corrected in Photoshop and in Lightroom. The other disadvantage for the 16 to 35 is that you give up a stop of light at a higher price. So on the plus side, you gain IS. But at $1,199, as nice as the 16 to 35 IS is, you better really need the difference in image quality to justify it. So for value, we gave the 16 to 35 an 8.5 out of 10. Overall, it gets a 47.5 out of 50 and our highly recommended rating. The final word. The 16-35 IS is just the latest in a string of really excellent, high-quality professional lenses put out by Canon. It's a highly competent lens that does a marvelous job of managing problem areas where other ultra-wide-angle lenses tend to struggle. However, to get that incremental improvement in performance, it comes at nearly two times the cost over the really excellent and arguably better-built Tokina 16-28 f2.8. If you haven't seen my review on that, be sure to check it out. In the end, it's up to you to decide if the improvement in optical performance is worth it. For me, I really like the 16 to 35 f4. I just wish it were priced a little bit lower. But truthfully, I'd probably be willing to bite the bullet and pay 
to get the difference in that notice, for that noticeable improvement in high contrast areas around windows for my interior shots. My clients will appreciate the difference. Well, at least I think they'll appreciate the difference. This is Darren Miles with Darren Miles Photography based here in beautiful, sunny Naples, Florida. If you like these reviews, please don't forget to subscribe. Thanks so much for watching, and until the next time, happy shooting.